great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alexandra Alea Castro to give this um, year's lecture. Um, Alexandra um, grew up in Bogota and did her undergraduate studies at the University um, Los Andes or Dos and Los Andes and then um, moved to Oxford, did a DPhil, um, spent some time at Caltech um, during that and then came to UCL with an EPSRC Career Acceleration Fellowship. Um, she was appointed to a lectureship and was promoted to a readership in 2015 and last year she won the Institute of Physics Maxwell Medal um, for theoretical physics. Um, so we're very pleased to uh, have you giving our lecture this year, Alexandra. Thank you very much. And I'll, I'll hand over to you without further ado. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank, very, thank you very much uh, for being here today. It is a pleasure for me. Um, actually, uh, I was invited to give this lecture last year because um, of the prize that I won, but I was in Bogota giving a TED talk at the time, so this is why I, I didn't do it this year, last year. But I'm happy that it's this year because there is a lot of nice, nice coincidences, as you will see during the evening. So to begin with, I would like to put some things in perspective. And I would like to start with this. This is our stunning Earth. It's a photo taken from the NASA space station. And just by coincidence, it happens to be a photo that is showing you Colombia, which is the country I was born. Just a coincidence. <laughs> and the story of Earth began 4.6 billion years ago. And this is a timeline between when the Earth started and when Homo sapiens appeared on Earth. And again, to continue putting things in perspective, just this week we were quite excited because scientists have been able to detect signatures of an event that happened 130 million years ago, so when dinosaurs were on Earth. So we were very excited about it. So I really hope that you feel very excited because the story that I will tell you today began a lot earlier than that. So just about a billion years later that the Earth, uh, the history of Earth began, the first life arises on Earth that was around 3.8 billion years ago. And just a few billion years later, we have the first photosynthetic organisms on Earth. This is photosynthetic bacteria, which is an oxygenic, uh, it does an oxygenic photosynthesis, so it doesn't produce oxygen and it doesn't use water as a reducing agent. It uses, some of them uses sulfur, for instance. But it is the beginning of life. It is still debatable whether it was coinciding with the original life or not, but it's around the same time. Two billion years later, photosynthesis oxygenic photosynthesis, the photosynthesis that we see today, started on Earth. This is around 2.1 uh, billion years ago, and it is known as the most important metabolic invention of nature. The reason is pretty simple. The multidiversity of life that we see today has origin on that photosynthetic uh, oxygenic organisms. So I hope you feel very excited to know that every day you have an evidence of something that has happened two billion years ago. So you were excited for something that happened 130 million years? Well, I hope you are excited just to be breathing because that's the reason we can do it. And whenever we are faced with the origin of life, we always wonder, what is life? And many scientists have asked this question through the history of science. I like this sentence that was given, that was said by Albert, uh, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this correctly, this is a Hungarian scientist, St. Georgi. He won the Nobel Prize in 1937 and he is usually co quoted by this uh, sentence and he said that life is nothing but an electron looking for a place to rest and with this he wanted to give a fundamental importance to the redox reactions that happens in, in uh, biological organisms. But I think that he was missing one particular aspect in this sentence because to begin with, where or how did this electron become out of rest? So I would add something to that sentence. 
and I would say that life starts with a clever handling of energy quantum. So who said this? No one famous, just me. <laughs> and it's my way of, of summarizing what I'm going to talk about during the rest of the lecture. The scale of photosynthesis is huge. Per year, photosynthesis produces 118 billion tons of biomass. So if you want to imagine what this is, I would like you to picture the shard building in London. This scale of photosynthesis is as if per hour, nature was producing 10,000 shard buildings. So it's huge. It's important for life on Earth. And this biomass production starts with a process that relies on a nanoscale molecular machinery. And what I would like to do now is I would like to zoom in into the plant, down to the chloroplasts, where you find the thylacone membrane in these cells. And even deeper there, at the nanometer scale, you find these molecules, supramolecules, some of which absorb energy, and some other ones that initiate the chemistry that supports every other, any other process from there on. These uh, biomolecules are around between five nanometers, uh, a few more, a few less, and the processes that I'm going to be talking about last for no longer than a picosecond. So you can even blink in that time. And these biomolecules <coughs> absorb light, they absorb photons, and in each biomolecule you find many chlorophylls in this case. They work collectively to absorb these photons, and this working collectively allows them not just to absorb not just to absorb one photon, but many different kinds of photons. And these, each of these photons generate another form of collective energy that we call an exciton. This exciton is passed around between light harvesting antenna, or these biomolecules, until it reaches a reaction center where the chemistry starts. This process, whenever it is low light, so imagine at the beginning in the morning, when the sun is just rising, or when you have full moon, so this is low light, this process happens with an efficiency that is over 90%. So what this means is that, is that every single photon that is absorbed will generate a chemical reaction in the reaction center. Um, no process on Earth, man-made, has this efficiency. So it is not surprising that scientists for a long time have tried to understand what is at the origin of this efficiency. I began this part of the lecture saying that life is a clever handling of energy quanta. And it is indeed, a leaf receives around 10 to the 16 photons per second. And it still manages not to burn. It has all the mechanisms to transfer the energy that is necessary and dissipate the rest. A bacteria in full moon will receive not so much photons. 300 photons, but still, because it's an organism that is used to very dim light, then it will also transfer a lot of these, the energy associated to this, but then will dissipate. We're interested in the process when they are not dissipating so much energy, they are just capturing one photon at a time, so handling a single quantum of energy at a time. And the same kind of Zooming process, I can do it in another photosynthetic organism. This is cryptophy algae. And I am zooming it into the cell membrane where I will find the photosynthetic apparatus for this organism. And then I will find this light harvesting antenna that absorb light and transfer energy to that reaction center. And the processes that happen here are important because they trigger events that will affect the biology and in all of the larger length scales. And at the same time, everything that is happening in the micrometer scale and in time scales that are longer than the picosecond will transform the events that will happen in this time scale. So this is really a multi-scale problem. 
and we are interested for now in understanding what happens here, but it's not that we are losing sight of how this, and precisely it's because we are interested in these effects because they will trigger what happens in the longer length and time scales. Now, the interest in this understanding of what is happening in the biomolecular scale and how can we describe this with physics and chemistry is not something that we began just a few decades ago. It is actually something that scientists started thinking right at the same time that the foundations of quantum mechanics were developed. And two of those pioneers in thinking about this promise, one is Niels Bohr with this um, very famous paper in 1933 where he was invited to talk about the possibility of using light to address or to cure some disease. And he was very humble, he said, I'm going to address this problem, but it's from the point of view of a physicist. Then a little bit later, Erwin Schrodinger uh, wrote this book, What is Life? And in that, he addresses different problems from the perspective of quantum mechanics. But in particular, in the preface of that book, you find that he presented the question that is not so far from the question that we ask today still. And is how can the events in space and time, which take place within the boundaries of a uh, living organism, can be explained with physics and chemistry? Now, in essence, that's the question we would like to answer. But several things have changed since then. So to begin with, <coughs> it is no longer when, when scientists address the scientific community, it is no longer just an assembly of scientific men. <laughs> Mostly men, but not only men. But most importantly, we have redefined the question that we are interested. Because all the scientific developments from there to now have allowed us to present this question in a different form. And I believe that the way you present a scientific question plays a very important role in how you are going to answer it. So the questions of interest that we have in mind now is, to put in some colloquial terms, is how much quantum technology is there in the biomolecular scale, but also how much biology is there in the quantum domain. What I would like to tell you about is a little bit of both. We don't know fully the answers to these questions, but we're making progress fast. Now, one thing that hasn't changed from that time is that this field has faced and continue facing bilateral uh, skepticism. And by this, I mean that biologists are still not convinced that we need to understand anything about quantum mechanics to really understand a biological process. And at the same time, some physicists, even in the face of experimental evidence, are not convinced that this is truly known uh, trivial quantum phenomena that is happening there. Now, these two papers that I'm putting here as an example are just papers based on thought, scientific discussions. But I like facts. And many other scientists also like facts. So in the last 50 years or more, 60 years, I think we have made tremendous progress to go from the scientific thought to the scientific evidence highlighting the quantum effects that you might find in these biomolecules. Not just in photosynthesis, but in other organisms. I, I focus here on photosynthesis because it is the area where we have more experimental results to actually back up this field. Now, it would be, um, it would be the subject of another lecture to go through all the scientific developments that have happened experimentally from there to now. But I wanted to highlight four that I find key for this field. First one is the ability to have the crystal structure of these biomolecules. And this began in 1950. That change, that was a breakthrough. It changed fully how we could understand biochemistry and biomolecular physics. Then later on, we wanted not just to know the structure, we want to know the dynamics of the electronic and vibrational motions that are in these biomolecules. And this has been possible because of the development of ultra-fast lasers, which began in 90, we got earlier than that, but in the 1980s, we have the dye laser where you can have pulses that are around 100 femtoseconds. And thus, that is the resolution, the minimum resolution you would need to start understanding these processes happening in these biomolecules. 
In fact, you need lasers that are of a resolution less than 50 femtoseconds. In 2007, inspired in the sister technique, which was um, two-dimensional or multidimensional spectroscopy, it was first in the infrared, actually was inspired in M NMR, but then it was developed first in the infrared. But in 2007, then you have the possibility to have this optical multidimensional spectroscopy. So it's essentially a technique that allows us to understand very, very fast processes in systems that, can you address, that you can address optically. And then all of these processes are in ensemble of molecules. So here you see this is a bottle that contain, contains many molecules that are being subject to these experiments. We have now the ability not just to understand ensemble of molecules, but individual molecules tracking time and in space what is happening there. So this has given solid foundations to how we can understand quantum effects in these biomolecules. But in parallel, we have had a tremendous uh, development and fast in the last 40 years in quantum science. These are developments that are more controlled. This is, these are experiments that are in a lab where you can, in a clean room, you can isolate molecules and atoms, lower the temperature to nanokelvins, and then handle one atom at a time, make interact this atom with light, and then obtain quantum coherence using these techniques. And not only has it been possible from the experimental viewpoint to have that control, which gave Cohen Tanuji the Nobel Prize a few years ago, but also from the theoretical viewpoint, we understand that quantum coherence is not just an, uh, an abstract concept that we do philosophy about it, nothing wrong with that, but it is something, it's a resource that can be manipulated to create new technologies. And while the development of these two areas that I have mentioned is not being one in hand with the other one, these are different communities indeed, when it comes to understand quantum effects in biology, they have come together. And by together I mean it's not that they harmonically decided, okay, we are going to address the problem. It's that the problem itself demands the interactions between these communities to have a better understanding. Still these interactions are um, I would say, face the challenge of the skepticism from all of them, from the quantum science to this, but I think there is overall, uh, this skepticism has been a driving force to actually gain clarity. I like to think that my work lies at the interface between these areas and that our efforts of my group here at UCL is try to bridge the understanding of these areas to give an answer to those questions that I presented at the beginning. So let me tell you what is what I think we know about how nature handles single quanta of energy. Let me begin now by introducing a more detailed picture of these biomolecules. I'm gonna pass around a 3D model of the biomolecule. Now, because I know you are adults, <laughs> kind of, <laughs> I will trust this beauty on your hands, and make, but please make sure that you treat it really softly because it was very hard to, to get it done and it's very expensive as well. And then as I talk, then when the molecule gets to you, you can understand a little bit better. So this is a 3D model, printed 3D, so now I'm in love with 3D printing, of this 2D version that I'm presenting here. This black, uh, units that you see here. This is a, this is a molecule, a, a light harvesting molecule that you get in cryptophy algae. And these elongated structures are the chromophores, so the pigment molecules that will absorb the light. Individually, each of them will absorb light. Collectively, they will absorb different light. And they are bound to, these, to a protein backbone, which is here illustrated with these ribbons. And the different colors illustrate that you have different kind of proteins there, okay? This protein scaffold not only gives a structure to these chromophores, a structure that depends on the niche in which the organism uh, survives and lives, but it also controls the individual energies that, that each of these chromophores can absorb. From the biological viewpoint, what we are interested in is in understanding the relation between structure and function. 
But now, in the modern times, we not only want to understand the relation between structure and function, but also the relation between structure, dynamics, and function, given that now we can understand that dynamics, or at least investigate it. Now, what I would like to tell you is how this molecule has evolved and is built up in nature to use any kind of interaction that you have there to transfer energy, not just efficiently, but in the most effective form depending on the metabolic requirements that the organism needs. And to do so, it, it, it uses, it balances two kinds of interactions. One that I will call here coherent electronic interactions. These are electrostatic interactions between these chromophores. And what they do is that once energy is absorbed, rather than keep the energy in one single place, it will delocalize it coherently across all the chromophores. But at the same time, because each of these chromophores <coughs> is interacting with the protein, the protein is essentially a thermal unit. It's, it's uh, vibrating, it has many types of vibrations, but it, these vibrations are thermally distributed. So you have thermal fluctuations. And what these thermal fluctuations do is the opposite to this delocalization, is they localize. So while coherent inter interactions lead to delocalization of the energy that is absorbed in these molecules, these thermal fluctuations will localize it. And these units balance these two to transfer. How do they do that? So they, to do that, they have a couple of strategies. So the first strategy is that they use this quantum sharing of a single quanta of energy. And by that, I mean the following. Let's focus on the simplest unit, and is rather than the food molecule, we will focus on the pair of, pair of chromophores that you find in the center of the molecule. So whoever has the molecule, if you look in the center of that molecule, you can open it a little bit, it's not a problem. In the center of that molecule, you find this pair of chromophores. Each of these chromophores, we represent them to a very good approximation as two-level systems. So by now you will remember your physics and you will know what a two-level system is, right? So each of them will have a ground state that I will call zero and an excited state that I will call one. But when they are interacting with this electrostatic interaction, it's that kind of dipole-dipole interaction, the new energies of this collective system are neither of the individual chromophores, but they are split, okay? And each of these energies can be, each of these states corresponding to these energies can be excited with different photons. Now, these are collective states, and by that we mean that you will have a superposition of having the first chromophore in the excited state and the second one in the ground state, or having the first chromophore in the ground state and the other one in the excited state. But you have two possible states. One has a plus and one has a minus. So one has a symmetric, it's a symmetric state, and the other one is an asymmetric state. These two are collective states, but they are not exactly, these excitations are not exactly distributed equally in the two chromophores. So some, you will have a large amplitude of probability for one state to find it in one chromophore, and the other state, you will have a large uh, amplitude of probability of finding these excitations in the other chromophore. Now, why is this important? Because while these molecules do want to have these collective effects to capture more different kind of photons, they still need that localized, quasi-localized nature so that I am able to talk about transfer. And this is why you don't have equal probability of finding excitation in the two chromophores. You will have a different one so that you can distinguish. The same principle is applied now to the molecule that you are passing around which has eight chromophores. And these illuminated areas is, I am highlighting the chromophores that have a larger amplitude. They have, they are distributing the whole molecule, but for each of these states, there is a pair of chromophores that have more amplitude of probability of having the energy than the other ones. This quasi-localization is important for energy transfer, as you will see. And again, in there, you have these states are a superposition of states of having each of these individual excited and the other ones in the ground state. And what I'm presenting here is the absorption spectrum 
Of course, because you have an ensemble of these molecules, you don't have sharp uh, peaks in that spectrum. You have a broader spectrum, but we can identify in which part of the spectrum will correspond to these states that I am presenting here. So you will tell me, OK, yeah, I can understand that, because any quantum system at that scale will behave like a quantum system and have quantized levels in the energy, and I will understand that. That's trivial quantum mechanics. Not entirely trivial, but it's very important quantum mechanics for photosynthesis. The reason is the following. Photosynthesis or photosynthetic organisms had developed a variety of light harvesting antenna. The one that you have there, well, this is another way of representing this molecular unit. It's the one that I'm passing around. This is the one that you find in spinach, the one that you ate this morning. Um, this is the one that you find in, in, in some bacteria. Um, this is, in this one, we don't know exactly the crystal structure, so this is actually a cartoon, uh, and so on. What is important about this figure is that, as you can see, each of them absorbs in different parts of the visible spectrum. So depending on the niche, they have evolved to absorb in, this, in these different parts of the visible spectrum to cover a wide range, but it's still not the full spectrum of light that air receives. So there is a limitation in natural selection. It will select for the wavelengths that are relevant for the living processes. What is important is that you have all these structures. They are, some of them are very symmetric. So I will pass this other molecule around. <coughs> so you can see this is the one that you find, well, not this one. This is the model of the one that you find in purple bacteria. It's very beautifully <coughs> symmetric. Um, and it has two different rings which absorb different energies. But you find also the, the green one that I'm passing around that seems to have no symmetry at all. Yet, they work very well when it comes to energy transfer. This is actually strategy <coughs> two, because the first one was the previous one, so I made a mistake here. And what I will tell you now is how they use this collective behavior to now transfer energy around in a non-trivial form. And for that, let's present the task in this form. The purpose or the function of this biomolecule is once energy is absorbed, it will be quasi-localized on one part of the molecule while still having non-zero amplitude in the other chromophores. And then the idea in this case is that pair of chromophores in the center. And the idea is that it will be transferred to one location that is important because from that location we have experimental evidence that is from this chromophore that energy is transferred mostly to another complex, either another antenna or that reaction center that I mentioned at the beginning. And to do so, again, these systems are going to balance these kind of interactions. They will balance these coherent interactions that will tend to delocalize the excitation, but they will also use these thermal motions that localize the excitation. So these thermal fluctuations that randomly will make the energy levels fluctuate and therefore change the direction in which energy can be transferred. So having these two kind of interactions, there are different options. Let me start with the first option. Imagine there is absolutely no localizing interactions here, only coherent interactions. If we start, if we do an experiment in which I manage to input a single photon of energy, and that photon will create an excitation, one of those collective states, but actually a superposition in such a way that I can guarantee that the excitation is localized in these two chromophores. We know that if it is a superposition of states, what is going to happen? It stays there. It doesn't stay there, right? So it will evolve in time, but it will evolve in a coherent form. It will go back and forth to this different. What this means in this energy landscape is that it will go from high to low energy, but then it will go coherently from low energy to high energy. And you will have a synchronized motion of the energy in this landscape. Effectively, transfer will never happen because as soon as it reaches the state where it is quasi-localized, in the pigment that I want to, it will go back to other energy levels that will bring it back to my original state. So 
it is not, it's, a, it's a nice picture to see this energy going back and forth in this energy landscape, but for transfer, I need something that will localize it. As soon as energy gets here, I need a mechanism that will tell me, okay, you don't go back. Well, then let's see what happens when that is the mechanism that dominates. So still I'm gonna have that energy landscape. So those are the possible states, energy states that I mentioned, those collective energy states. Using just thermal fluctuations, <coughs> we know that we can make this system go from one state to another state down in energy with certain probability, randomly. We can also make the system going up in energy and the probability to go down and up should satisfy detail balance. And this is what thermal fluctuations do. It only makes the system randomly go from one energy configuration to the other one, and I have this dynamic balance that needs to satisfy this detail. Now, this is an effective form to get there, but I don't know if it is better when I have a combination. I can also have another way of transfer energy in this case, and is I have mostly incoherent interactions that essentially destroy any possibility of coherence in these systems. And by this, what we mean is as soon as the energy is absorbed, these thermal motions are so strong that localize it fully in that center. From there on, then the only option is to have a random walk. Just as if I threw a coin and I do a step randomly, I threw the coin again to decide in which direction I'm gonna move and I move randomly and so on. And it is possible and that in some of these systems, this is precisely what is happening. As soon as excitation is localized, it is as if the system, the thermal fluctuations are such that any delocalization is lost, and then randomly it will, lead, it will jump. By jump, I mean it will get de-excited, and then another chromophore will get excited randomly, and randomly, and effectively, randomly, I will arrive, this energy will arrive to the chromophore that is of interest. So the question is, what is the strategy really that is happening in these biomolecules? The answer wasn't very easy. There was a lot of hypotheses, some predictions from some experiments, but it was only until we had optical to dimensional spectroscopy that we started to understand what the answer to this was. And this optical to dimensional spectroscopy, you cannot see it very well here, but what you have is this sample. You have three laser pulses passing through the sample, and then this sample giving a, a, a signal, that is the signal that I'm going to analyze to give one particular information. I want correlations in this system between the energies that it absorbs and the energies that it emits, because those correlations will tell me how it is, the energy is moving in this energy landscape. The first group, <coughs> it was the group of Graham Fleming in, at the University of California, Berkeley that was showing that actually what was happening there was more or less something in between the three strategies that I presented. You do have some kind of coherent transfer, but it doesn't last forever. It lasts for about 500 femtoseconds in the best case scenario, 200 femtoseconds in other scenarios. After Graham Fleming, a postdoc that was working with him now with his own group, then show similar signals and similar oscillatory behavior in those signals, those electronic signals, uh, but now at room temperature, and no, no, late, no more later uh, after this, Greg Scholes at the time at the University of Toronto, now at the University of Princeton, show the same for the organisms that have that um, cryptophile algae protein that I'm passing around, the green one. And Without getting into the details of these experiments, what is important is that after 10 years of debating what these experiments meant, is that they have forced us to understand that we need to go back to rethink what, is, what these thermal motions are doing. And that actually, in order to transfer energy, the energy is being shared coherently with some of those thermal motions that I have there. So let's go back to the picture of the two chromophores that I talked at the beginning. Our original picture is that they will be two level systems. Now, these two level systems represent electronic states. 
but we also know that these electronic states are bound to the nuclei motion. Now, normally we represent that nuclei motion as a collection of harmonic oscillators. It happens that some of these harmonic oscillators, which are initially in thermal distribution, so you have a probability that follows Boltzmann distribution for these uh, nuclei motions to be in any of those levels, but it happens that some of them have an energy, a vibrational quanta, that is more or less of the same energy of the difference between the two chromophores. And whenever that happens, then you have another transfer pathway. You can use a vibrational quanta to actually transfer energy from one chromophore to the other one. Now, when this happens, when it is exactly one vibrational quanta that is used as a way of transferring energy between chromophores, those vibrations are no longer in a thermal equilibrium, but rather they are out of thermal equilibrium. And they are in a particular quantum state that is not a classical state. It's a state in which we have added exactly one quanta. So life began with clever forms of handling this quanta. This is probably one of the cleverest forms. It has found a way of driving these thermal motions out of thermal equilibrium, making a resonance, and then using it to transfer energy. Now, this is at the moment a hypothesis that is being debated. Because while we have shown that there is some kind of oscillatory feature there, understanding exactly that it's coming from these vibrations is still under experimental scrutiny. Now, one of the key things that my group at UCL, mostly because I, I was obsessed and actually kind of, not obsessed, but I really, really wanted to show that this phenomena was not just a trivial quantum phenomena. It's not just that we have energy quantization. It's that when we use that quantization to transfer energy, we truly form non-trivial quantum states. And in quantum mechanics, the way to show that you have a non-trivial quantum phenomena is that you show that you are violating a classical inequality, or that you are violate, or that that is a phenomena that no classical theory will ever be able to predict. So we decided, okay, we're going to show that this is indeed a non-trivial quantum phenomena. This is a work that we did with a former PhD student, Edward O'Reilly. And what we were able to show is that in this picture in which you have collective electronic states with energy transfer being assisted by vibrational quanta, that are of the same energy scale that the energy differences between the states in the system, then the thermal distribution that you have here is not a classical thermal distribution. It's not like the thermal light that we're seeing here, or the thermal motions that we might imagine when we're boiling something. It is a thermal distribution that has fluctuations that have so narrow that I can nearly say that the majority of the systems are in the first quantum state. Quantum mechanically, what that means is that whenever I have a thermal distribution, you need a Gaussian distribution to describe the motions. Well, this is a distribution that is not Gaussian at all. And it's a distribution, it's a probability distribution that has some negativities. So now, just from fundamental mathematics, we know that in probability, classical probability, do you ever find a probability that, that is minus one? No. But quantum mechanically, Whenever you have non-trivial quantum phenomena, and by this I mean superposition of states, it is possible to find probability distributions. In this case, this is the probability distribution for the position and momentum of this oscillator. And those probability distributions give you some negativities. And this is an, an ambiguous signature, at least theoretical, that you do have a non-trivial quantum phenomena. Now, we were very excited about this result. And actually, it was well received by the community. But they always ask me one question. This is a very nice theoretical argument. How do we measure that experimentally? So for the past three years, we've been devising forms of measure this experimentally. We still don't have the answer, not the full answer, but we are on our way. 
I'm not going to talk about that answer, but I'm actually going to talk about the four strategy in which these systems use quantum mechanics. And is, I already gave an insight by saying that the vibrational quanta has an energy that creates a resonance in these systems. This happens in average. And what I mean in average is that, in general, we have an ensemble of molecules. And that's the average behavior that one might observe. But in reality, when I go to see one molecule at a time, I have a heterogeneity of quantum processes happening. We don't know very well what that heterogeneity is, but I'm going to show you the possible options of the transfer here. Now, this is a, <coughs> this is a screenshot of this website. You find, it, you find it in the outreach part of my website, and it's a simulation that was developed by Richard Stones, who is another one of my PhD students just about to submit his thesis. And it's a simulation that will tell you how these different types of, in of interactions that I just spoke about it can be balanced to transfer energy. Now, the purpose is going to be I'm going to start energy in the red pigment that I have here, and the purpose is to get it to the green one. And I'm going to move the structure, which means these chromophores, from one protein to another one and another one. In each case, the experiment will be such that I will uh, input that excitation and then measure the transfer time here. And I want to select the one in which I transfer, transfer fast in average. We will see that sometimes this one transfers faster. Sometimes it's this one. But in average, we'll see which one gives me the fastest transfer. So this is something you can play with if you get excited about this. Good. And so if you go to the website, then you will see now I have it in, in the condition one in which I have very weak thermal fluctuations. And then what I see, you can see that two of those chromophores are excited at the same time. And you can see then growing intensity and decreasing intensity. And with that, it's a way of illustrating coherent transfer. And eventually, after many of these um, realizations, so here, eventually when it gets here, I have a mechanism that takes the energy out of there. And then what I am doing here is I let this to run for a certain time. And you can see this is the average time that it took for the excitation to get here, seven picoseconds. And it's in average because I have to put many of these before I could count that average. So if we now do the same experiment, but now in the second molecule, where I have medium level of those interactions, and by medium I mean that all the energy scales that are associated to these interactions are of the same order. They are very similar. And in that case, we do the experiment again. So you can see now this vibrating a little bit more. So it's to indicate that you have more of these thermal fluctuations. And you can see that at some times, you do have some kind of coherent transfer, illustrated here by having two of these uh, illuminated at the same time and changing these illuminations in a coherent fashion. And then eventually, it reaches here. And the average transfer was 2.61 picosecond. Now, I can go to when I have very strong interaction with the protein background, so which means thermal fluctuations will dominate. And then in that case, you don't see much coherence. You see a little bit, but in general, you see the excitation at every time, mostly localized in one of them. But it stays for so long that it takes quite a long time to get here. Not so long the, as the coherent case, but a little bit longer than this intermediate regime. So what experiments are showing is that nature somehow has managed to evolve to have all these energy scales being around the same order, to have an average behavior that is as the one that I presented here in the middle. But as I said, that's the average behavior. Some molecules will be like this one. I doubt that some will be like that, because you always have a good level of thermal motion there. But you will have something in between. <coughs> yes. So, just to finish, actually, while we are able to measure this average behavior, nature do need that heterogeneity. 
I'm going to show you. This is an image of uh, the membrane of purple bacteria. Each of these little, this is an atomic force microscopy image. And each of these circles that you see here is like the yellow molecule that is being passed around. Where is it? Can I have it back, please? <laughs> <laughs> the green one as well. <laughs> Thank you. And just because we're about to finish, so I, I need to. So each of these molecules have these two rings. And even though they appear symmetric, the energies of this, um, that these two rings absorb can vary, even just from one to the other one. And actually, thank you, rather than having just one sharp effective average transfer, transfer time between two of these ones or between this ring, the blue ring here and the red ring here, you have a distribution. What is interesting is that this distribution of transfer times or transfer rates is not a Gaussian distribution. So it's not just something random that happens in the system, but it always has these tails and it's these outliers as always, who tell us something also very interesting, not just the ones that are in the average, but the outliers always tell us something important for the function of this photosynthetic membrane. Sometimes I will need really fast transfer between, between the two of these rings, but some other times, some of these ones will take quite long to transfer, maybe to prevent overloading the system, okay? So we are still understanding exactly how is that this heterogeneity plays a role in biology, but we know it will be relevant when it comes, for instance, to photoprotection, to regulate the energy transfer in this system. But what this means is that nature has managed also to have this variety of quantum properties to actually satisfy this overall function of transfer, not just from one molecule to another one or within one molecule, but across long distances. Now, the way it does that is very clever genetically. Uh, what you see here is the, well, it's actually the, ah, yeah, it's the blue ring. The blue ring that you saw in this molecule is this blue ring that you hear. You have 18 chromophores. And these 18 chromophores are not, are not bound just randomly or just that nature just has some symmetry constraints and it has bound those chromophores like that. What nature has done is it has built a subunit. And the subunit is I have this alpha beta protein subunit and it bounds three chromophores. Now, the important thing is that this organism in particular has encoded genetic information that allows to express different genes depending on the climate that it's exposed to. And what this does, in, effectively, in effect, is that by changing the composition of this protein, it changes the absorption fully and it changes then the quantum properties of the transfer. But we are restricted in nature, but what nature needs to do. We want to do what we want to do, what we would like to do. And what we would like to do is have control of that. Now, there have been many efforts to do <coughs> fully artificial systems that rival the capabilities of these natural systems, so far without success. But more recently, uh, some biochemists, in particular Leslie Dutton at the University of Pennsylvania, I think, um, has devised a form of creating an artificial protein subunit with linked chromophores that will rival the capabilities of the natural systems and actually go beyond because I have no limitation in the kind of chromophores that I can put there and therefore I can have chromophores that absorb very well in the infrared where these, plant, these organisms do not absorb any longer. And what is important is that the way they've done this is they have a series of amino acids that they can control polar and hydrophobic, and then they can create these uh, subunits in which one part will be polar and the other one will be hydrophobic, and therefore these light harvested proteins are water soluble. This is very important because in nature, these proteins are embedded in a membrane, so they are not mobile. They are limited to be in the membrane. But if you have water-soluble light harvested proteins that will not aggregate, but that will flow freely, then you can have these ones in vivo or in vitro in different parts of the biological organism. So in effect, we are now reaching to a tool in which we can change 
the way some of these systems might do photosynthesis. And the change is at the level of the quantum properties. Is this just part of photosynthesis? Is this something we can do only in photosynthesis? I don't think so. There is a wide range of biological phenomena that starts or depends strongly of bio pro processes that happens at the level of different biomolecules. I have illustrated here like harvesting. I didn't go in detail or even in, in more, um, describe more what happens in reaction centers, but it's very similar to the like harvesting complexes. We find th those kind of processes in the membrane, in, in the retinal, when we look at night and we're able to see the, the processes that are happening there. We will need to describe them at the quantum level to understand fully what is going on there. There are some more controversial, mostly because we don't have access to the X-ray structure of this one. Like, for instance, in the case of other receptors, there is a possibility that they are using also vibrational quanta to lock to each other. But because we don't have the structure of that one, then we don't know very well yet what is going on there. We have the same type of hypothesis for radical pairs in cytochromes inside the retinal of some birds and some other animals. And we have the same or similar kind of uh, transport uh, processes, in this case hydrides or nu nuclei, so massive particles in comparison to the electrons. What I'm interested in is to know whether we might be able to find common principles of handling, not just single quanta, but single electrons, single nuclei. With that, I would like to finish not without thanking the previous and current members of my group who decided to engage in this very difficult but exciting field, and the collaborators past and present who I have had very enlightening discussions, and those who, thank you, gave us the funding. Thanks very much. Yes. Because it, uh, it is composed of uh, a number of states with uh, different energy. It is unstable but right from the beginning. It has a finite lifetime. Is it that this, that these states' lifetime um, uh, is long in comparison with the transfer time? This is a very good question, and yes. So these excited states last for about a nanosecond. So before they re emit, and a photon is emitted to the vacuum and then we lost this excitation. These states last for about a nanosecond. But the transfer process only lasts a picosecond. Uh, sorry. Maximum, uh, yeah. You've a, a statement about negative probability, which I have to say really hurts my understanding. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, because negative probability distribution, yeah. Not probability, but probability oh, distribution. Outside. No. Size bar squared. So no, we are not talking about size squared. We are, we are not talking about the wave function. We are talking about a mathematical object that might be equivalent to a density matrix. So this is a p distribution. This so, okay. yeah. Right. So in quantum optics, to describe the state of, for instance, light, we can use either the Wigner distribution or the p distribution or the q distribution, and this is equivalent to one of those, but for the nuclear motion here. One last statement. In the distant future, is it possible when you have understood all these uh, mechanisms that you might have a, a way of being able to grow electronic instrumentation? Sort of, uh, I mean, being able to grow computers, for example. The future is bright. I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would, be, I, I do think that we have now with this genetic manipulation, not just by doing mutations in these systems, but also by creating these artificial units that are very similar in the sense of what they do, but that we can control at the level of interactions with this particular point in the protein, etc. I do think that the merging of that with the capabilities of self-repair of biological organisms will allow us to build up things that we can never, cannot imagine right now. 
I'd like to just ask a question about scale, because yeah. wavelength of light is yes. from these molecules. Yeah. And so what is the photon? So, is it, is it actually, it's, it's, it's comparable. The wavelength is comparable to the size. So we have, so we have the frequencies that is in the in the green molecule is about 645 nanometers, but the length scale of one of these molecules is no longer that 20 nanometers. So you see that the the wavelength is a lot larger, which means that every chromophore in the system sees the same field. So this is why they act collectively. Part of no, they yeah. At least in nature, that no, that's not what is happening. Yeah, of course you can build synthetic units in which then maybe they are larger than this wavelength, and then you can address locally every chromophore. But in this case, no, you have uh, you have the wavelength actually spans a large area in the photosynthetic membrane, and therefore covers several of these. Uh, I they are not uniform, so it's not that they are exactly, but they are about the same, exactly the same order of magnitude. Yeah. In fact, it is not individual molecules what it would be important. So let me just go back to this picture. We don't have the image of all the photosynthetic apparatus in all the organisms, but this one in purple bacteria does give us some interesting insights. And you see big rings. You see these big rings, and you see the smaller rings. The big rings are the reaction centers. I don't have a model of that one. That would cost 3,000 pounds, so it's too expensive. <laughs> so I had to do <laughs> the cheapest one. Uh, but you have that you have this big ring surrounded by small rings. And then you see here, and you see them surrounded. So there seem to be minimal units that function. And the minimal unit will be one reaction center, or maybe two reaction centers surrounded by these. Um, LH2, as, as we call these ones. And those mil minimal units might be precisely the size mm -hmm. of this so wavelength. Those quantum states you're describing affect the whole molecule. The whole molecule is part of the same quantum Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And by molecule, I mean exactly these are electronic states, so are the states associated to the chromophores. Yeah. Is the, is the, I wouldn't say that is the whole of the protein because the protein doesn't absorb optically anything. What absorbs optically is, in, in this particular case, these are bacterial chlorophylls, and in the middle they have a magnesium. And it's that magnesium atom, the one that you can actually excite, are, are the electrons of these ones, the ones that get excited. And therefore, it is collective electronic states that you can excite with optical light. Yeah. Good question. She, she had a question since a long time ago. Gentleman's question there about the future. I mean, uh, yeah. well, when you mentioned about artificial water soluble light paths in proteins, I mean, there's still a possibility that engineers might, you know, rather than us growing on a buggy, so to speak, you have a sort of bottles of this stuff on your roof instead of a solar yeah. panel. So, I, of course, every scientist is biased. <laughs> Even if we don't want to accept it, we are. And what I presented here is what I find the most exciting and promising for both in vitro and in vivo. But there are many other efforts that I didn't mention here. And indeed, that there are efforts in which you just grow green algae on a surface and you use that green algae to capture light. So that is already happening. There are also other efforts in which you use DNA, origami as a material, in which you can put artificial chromophores wherever you would like to put it. I don't know if I have a slide here. And in what, what they haven't been able to do with this uh, origami material is to manage to get it close enough to have these collective states that I'm talking about. So the energy that they have there is that random energy, the one that I symbolize with throwing a coin and then randomly go to the next chromophore, etc., without any coherent delocalization. So there are efforts actually to create nanomaterials using origami or more living the symbiotic kind of, I um, don't know if symbiotic is the right word, but this. Um, this systems in which you will have some kind of algae uh, covering a surface and using that to uh, capture solar energy. The difficulty with those ones is that we don't have full control. We are doing an, a trial there. So we, we know that algae will do photosynthesis. We put it there and we absorb, but we, are, we don't have control. The reason I'm excited about this is because we're manipulating at the quantum level to achieve what we would like to. And I think that kind of 
quantum control. In this case, it's not the quantum control that you have in the lab with the laser cooling down. This is happening at room temperature in a very noisy environment and it's still by manipulating the amino acids that you have in this protein and the locations of your chromophore, you can vary these quantum properties. So I'm biased by that. Yeah, you, you had in one of your slides natural selection or overcoming it. I just wonder uh, in this bringing together physics and biology, do you make use of Darwinian principles to decide why certain quantum states are favored relative to that? So this is a good question. In biology, whenever <laughs> you talk about anything being functional, you need to refer to evolution. Unfortunately, there hasn't been many evolutionary studies just to know whether nature has really selected these interactions through evolution or where these interactions are just present there because of biological constraints. There was one recently published, a uh, debatable one, in which they take one molecule that I didn't illustrate here. Ah, actually, yeah, it is the molecule that I use in this, we use in this simulation. This is called FMO. It's just because it's the molecule that is more understood. For me, it's not the most exciting one uh, because it's one in which the energy levels are all comparable with KBT. So I think everything that is happening there is very driven by thermal fluctuations. So I like more the molecules in which you have an energy scale that is not equal to KBT but larger because then we know that we have the chance to beat thermal fluctuations with other processes. And they did that uh, first attempt of evolutionary study, which I think is, it's, 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 a fair, it's a good beginning. What they are arguing uh, from this evolutionary study is that at least for this molecule, they don't seem to have concluded that nature has selected these interactions particularly. Now, I take that with, as you know, skepticism for one reason. This is a particular study in one particular biomolecule and with one particular measure for the coherence that they were doing. So who knows if we now decide to measure coherence differently, then we might then have different results. But we are on that way uh, to do these evolutionary studies. Yeah. Uh, sorry, it's probably a really simple biological question. So you have this quantum of light and it gets transferred between these different chromophores either through the thermal mechanism or through this coherence effect or combination of the two. Once it's at that final site, what's the functionality of having that quantum there and how does it facilitate this? OK, I'll, I'll go back to here. So most of these molecules have always a side that seem to be closely interacting with the complex to which it will transfer. So let me show you here uh, this one in this video. And then I'm just going to go here. Uh, this is just cartoons of these biomolecules inside the thylacol membrane. And as you can see, this molecule is close to other molecule, but this one, rather than only being close to other molecule, is close to the reaction center. And the reaction center is the natural battery in these photosynthetic systems. It will take that quanta of energy, it will use it to drive an electron from one chromophore to the other one and create a voltage this, this will be used to create a voltage across the membrane. And it's that voltage that will drive all the energy conversion processes that you need for life. So it is very important to transfer energy to this reaction center. And in many of these or organisms, what they find is that this biomolecule, in particular, one of these um, pigments or chromophores will be closer to this reaction center. And therefore, it is hypothesized that that is the chromophore that will eventually, because of close interactions to the reaction center, will transfer energy there. It's a bit, I don't want to, it's, it's, don't want to be too utilitarian because it's, the physics is fascinating in itself, but nature is in the end then making ATP and, and Absolutely. And things like that, that, which in the end, if we want to extract um, usable energy from ourselves and translate, we probably only have to burn or something, which is a, to make, to drive turbines, which is pretty low efficiency. Is there any prospect of taking these electrons directly and making them into, like, as you would with a solar cell, with a higher energy? Absolutely. Energy? Yeah, so this is, this is why, so there is a, a couple of efforts. This DNA origami, what they are taking is inspiration from the fact that you have these delocalized states to overcome certain energy barriers there and to take an electron. So we had a proposal in which we will take one of these reaction centers 
connect it to electrodes and actually use the current that, that was coming out of there. Yeah, so we recently published uh, a paper proposing that. No, no, this one wasn't the voltage over the cell because we wanted the, we wanted the electrodes deep in the protein. So if you have that very deep in the protein, you are not going to do the voltage across the cell. So we only wanted to have this more like a nanoelectronic uh, unit, but not directly to the cell. But we do have uh, scientists trying to create a voltage. So let me see if I can find a, wait a second. I'm going to hide the image for a second while I find a presentation in which I, I have the scientists and what they're trying to do to strap current there. Just, just give me one second. Um, Yeah, so. <coughs> Sorry, it, this is another presentation. But this is that protein. This is the reaction center. This is an electrode. It's a gold tip, and this is on a gold surface. So essentially, they are building a circuit and just extracting the current from there. But they are also, I need to go quickly here, here doing the same at the level of taking the full, here I'm just presenting one molecule, but really the photosynthetic apparatus has many of these molecules. So this uh, Itamar Wilmer, I think he is in Jerusalem, if I'm not mistaken, oh, sorry, in Israel. Yeah, I think, if I'm not mistaken, uh, but he's actually using the full, the full length of the photosynthetic apparatus, including the different reaction centers and the different like, harvesting complex putting these two electrodes and getting current out of, out of there. So this is, yeah. Okay. And then trying to use more of them and see. So. Afraid, I, I, sorry to keep thinking about having another presentation yep. there. That's that's fine. Um, and thank you, and sorry for using up the last of the question time. As you can see, that's clearly stimulated a lot of thought and interest in the audience. And Great. we are now all invited back to the physics department for a free dinner drink. For the, well, everyone's invited, whether you're going to dinner or not. Um, come over and I'm sure Alexander will be happy to continue discussion. So thank you very much again. Thank you.